We, we, we even, <laughs> even if we have crutches, we have a rock to stand on. Amen. Um, today is a special day in our church because we have what we call the Expo, the Greater Grace Expo, which is the uh, presentation to the body regarding the activities, uh, community groups, uh, ways of serving in our church. Uh, and this is all demonstrated in the uh, family center, which is just down the sidewalk here. Uh, and after the service, actually the service continues by leading you down the sidewalk to the family center where you can go in and see the different tables and the booths that are set up uh, with the people that volunteer to serve in our church and in the community in different capacities. One, I give you one example, meals. There are, there's a women group in our church, women's group in our church that makes meals for people. Uh, so somebody uh, is not, is, is shut in or somebody comes home from the hospital or they, they lost a loved one and the women, they, they have an organized effort to bake a meal or cook a meal and deliver it to the home. Ushers is another one. Um, teenage outreach, uh, community groups in Rosedale, Hamilton, uh, Middle River, and so on. Uh, so I'd like you to, um, uh, we'll, we'll start by just asking the leaders of those groups to come up on stage just so that you can see them. So could, would you do that if you're one of those leaders? Come on up. Yeah, come on, move it forward a little bit, just so make room for everybody. Great. Okay. <clears throat> As they stand here, I'd like to just share a few words. Um, when you are born again and you have the new nature of Christ in you, then you have also new capacities. You have gifts of the Spirit. You have the life of Christ in you. You have love. Many times when we, when we are part of a church, we wonder, how do we fit in? What could I do? Who am I? What am I learning? How can I practice it? In the Bible, we read about one man, his name was Philip in the book of Acts. He was asked to, by the apostles, to help distribute the relief money to the needy, and we might say bickering, widows in Acts chapter 6. It is doubtful that before he undertook this ministry that he sat down to decide whether, he not, whether or not he had that spiritual gift of helps. But it was an opportunity to serve, and he took it. He proved faithful in performing this, and then God opened up to him another ministry, which was to evangelize the Samaritans. And then later in Acts 21, you see him living up in Caesarea in verse 8, and he was an evangelist there. The point is that when you are, are stepping into faith and you're stepping into serving, you don't know where it will bring you and you don't know what your capacity is, but you just start doing something. And I just want to encourage you that are, are sitting here, maybe your place is to come to the church and be taught and Listen and grow in your faith and pray and love your brother and sister. 
but maybe also you are stirred in your heart to get more involved. Uh, these people that are standing on the stage will help you. If you want to say, you know, what could I do? And at the end of the service, when we go over there, you may meet these people and, uh, you know, get a sense of, yeah, maybe I could do this. One mother here, she has two teenagers, and she said, let's uh, take your allowance money, buy food, cook a meal, and then deliver it to somebody that is needy. What a, what a way to train our children in serving and participating. Whatever capacity you have, Philip started, and I think at the end of his life, he was amazed at what God had given him because he was faithful in the beginning as he started off. So I'm going to just ask some of these folks to just say, what do you do in the ministry? Uh, Southeast Overly, uh, we do evangelism, uh, discipleship, uh, sports club. Please come and join us. <laughs> Carolyn? Uh, the we minister to the women in the prison in Towson. Uh, Pastor Cooper, I'm your outreach director here. Uh, we train and lead you in evangelism and soul winning. Great. Pastor Jason? Uh, yes, a follow-up visitation, and we also work with Seven Footsteps and Community Group South, uh, Southeast Parkville. I do the males ministry, and it's also open to men who can cook. So <laughs> okay. I had to get that in. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> How many men are cook? How many we, men we, cook? We yeah. have, well, if we they are, cook. you're more than welcome. What's the name of the ministry again? It's called Meals Ministry. Meals, yeah. yeah. So yeah. We just uh, deliver food to people who have just come home from the hospital, maybe broke a leg or have cancer or, you know, we, whatever needs they have, and then we call the people on the days that they can cook. I can cook on a Tuesday, so yeah. okay. So they'll, they'll, I'll call them for a Tuesday, two days before, and deliver the meal to the person. Yeah. Or we have a driver who can deliver if they c don't have a car. Now there's another ministry here. It's Helping Hands. Who does that? That is Trisha. Helping Hands. Okay, help, Helping Hands is they um, maybe maybe um, you needed a ride to go get go to the hospital or to a doctor's appointment. If you don't have transportation, helping hands. You call up, they, they will try to help. Uh, you live alone at home, you need to move a piece of furniture from that room to that room, call helping hands. Isn't that beautiful? Huh? Hey. Hi. I see. Um, it's run through the Enrich department, so I didn't consider myself a leader. Um, but they have um, an email list, and when somebody has a need, usually for people who don't have a big support group, who don't have family or friends, um, they can call the church Enrich department, and they'll send out an email to everybody who is on the list who would like to help out. Yeah. Um, I have a, a, a woman that I help that <clears throat> needs a lot of help. Um, and sometimes I'll wash her dishes, you know, sometimes I'll go to the grocery store for her. What do you, what do you charge? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, what do you think I could get? <laughs> hey, doesn't this sound like a great deal? I think I'm gonna call in the morning. Uh, it's amazing. Anyone else here? How about Bill? Thank you. Every day, 22 uh, American veterans commit suicide due to PTSD. And we have an outreach called um, Warrior Call, where we reach out to these warriors, and we have a database where we can connect them with their old battle buddies, and they communicate. And uh, the greatest country in the world has 22 of our veterans commit suicide, and our government, quite frankly, does very little about it. And we're trying to do something about it. Beautiful. Amazing. Mm. 
Wow, that's amazing, huh? Okay, uh, Brian. Uh, so I lead the Young Adults Connect group. Um, so we meet every second Saturday of the month, um, and then you know maybe more frequently. Uh, so if you're between 18 and 35-ish, um, you know, see me at the Expo. Uh, so it's a uh, it's a great opportunity to you know get to know other people you know in this age group because uh, it's a really it's a really unique age um, and we can really get a lot done um, and really go forward in the Lord in a lot of ways. Uh, Anna. Join the choir. We need you in the choir. We love you. <laughs> yeah. Move in. Uh, a little small outreach in Parkside. Join us if you want to soul win. We just we are servants. We go serve the community. I just wanted to clarify something because we have ushers and chapel support staff, and a lot of people don't know that. They think we're and we're still ushers, the ones that do the offering and put the water on the pulpit and do different things around the chapel. So we have our own little group. We don't have to seat people or do guard duty at the doors or anything, that's the ushers. We have a whole separate group that if you're interested in just doing the more basic things of being friendly to people and just, you know, it's an offshoot of the greeters group, you know? So yeah, well not that ushers can't be nice, but yeah. But you know, the, the, it, it's, like a, it's, it's, like the, it's like the good cop, bad cop scenario, you know? We're the good cops, they're the bad cops. We all do the same job though. But we have a booth over there, so sign up there if you're interested in that, too. Uh, Coach Lynch. Uh, we got Greater Grace Youth Athletics, also known as CYA, for kids between 5 and 13. Then uh, David Ryan, come on. He, he's in the play every spring. Which, which uh, role does he play? Jesus. He's Jesus. He does a good job, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. What do you want to say about the play? My Jesus ministry needs you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a booth down in the family center. It's just me. <laughs> no, I... Yeah, I do also uh, help in the play, but we also uh, I also help lead the um, junior teen ministry, which is sixth to eighth grade kids, eleven to fourteen years old, and we have a lot of help in that area. We could use a lot more. We're trying to do a lot of different events. We have Sunday morning services and Wednesday night services for them, uh, but we also are getting involved in visitation, uh, trying to take kids out for lunch. We do different events. Bible studies, open gym nights, guest speakers, musicians, things like that. Crazy, crazy uh, just time in uh, kids' lives in that, in that particular age group. It's just like a whirlwind. It's unbelievable. And uh, we're looking for just people to help and uh, let these kids know, let our young people know really who God is, what uh, this life is really, really about, because they have... I think uh, they've got a lot coming to them um, in the years to come, just seeing where we're at in our culture and society, and um, they need <laughs> as much help. I mean, we all need help, but I feel like that age group especially needs as much help as they can get. And um, yeah, also for the, for the play, the play is a great time. It's an amazing, fun, uh, just, I don't know, it's kind of hard to even talk about the experience of being in the play. It's just so much... Whatever you're doing, I mean, makeup, sound crew, lighting, stage hands, uh, acting, singing, you know, band people. I mean, anyone would probably tell you the play is just awesome, and it's like just being involved in it is on another level. So um, we invite you to, when that time comes around, we'll, someone will let you know, I guess, <laughs> and help out. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat>
What a great church. A great grace is upon us and because of our new birth, Christ came into this world for us to deliver us from our biggest problem, which is sin. I was reading this past week about the subject of sin, and I realized how important it is for us to see what it is and understand what it is in the right context. It really is an enemy in our life. Many people underestimate what it means, and many people don't really know what it is. I have three words that I want to share with you about that subject, and then, then two other parts to our sermon this morning. Again, uh, at the end of the service, we can go to the, fellows, the uh, family center and interact with these people and think about perhaps something that God would lead you in in regards to what has happened in your life by your new birth. Because you were at one time lost and without the nature of Christ in you. At that time, in 1 Peter chapter 4, let's, let's first read Proverbs 21, 16. <clears throat> Lord, we pray you would minister your word to us and speak to our hearts. Instruct us in doctrine and thinking with you because we have been born again. And Christ dwells in us. In Jesus' name, amen. 21, verse 16. I think I'll have you stand, please. Would you just stand with me as you read this verse with me? Are you ready? Verse 16. One, two, three. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. One more time. The man that wandereth. Now hold it. Wandereth, that is a Hebrew word that is translated um, it, it means a deliberate wandering, a deliberate and intentional moving away, and it is uh, known by the person that they are wandering, and they are moving, and it is in the um, Hebrew, this word is a T, let's see, I'm sorry, let's see. T A A H, and it is a certain kind of sin. Yeah, there are many words in the Hebrew for sin, also in the Greek, and this is one of them. It is when when I move away, and it can be translated the word "err" to "err" or "make mistake." to err from where I'm going in the, okay, so wandering, verse 16, man that wanders out of the way of understanding. So he has understanding. At one time, he understands, and then he moves away from it. Okay, now, now verse 16, well, shall remain in the congregation of the dead. You will remain in the congregation of the dead. So now I'll turn to your neighbor and ask them, what is the congregation of the dead?
Okay, you may be seated. Now, 1 Peter chapter 4, we will answer that question in the sermon. We have the word, another word for um, sin in the Hebrew, ra, and it means a a deliberate tearing down and destruction, uh, breaking up or ruin. It often means calamities. It is translated the word wicked many times. It is 444 times in the Old Testament, this word ra. ra. And it is, um, we can think of it that uh, the tearing down of that which is good, that which is from God. When God planted the Garden of Eden, as Satan went in there and his plan was to tear it down. When God has established our nation, the United States of America, you can be sure that Satan has a plan, Ra which is to tear it down, break it up into pieces, and ruin it. And if you have not ever sensed that in your own heart, then maybe you're not a human being. Because this evil or wickedness that is sin is in our very nature. And it is characterized in many ways, different ways, uh, and actually there is a a definition for sin, which is commonly used in our Bible. It's like a target, you know, an arrow. And we have a target here with a bullseye. And shooting the arrow and missing the target, coming short of the target. And there's another sense. It is shooting and hitting an entirely different target. This is what sin does. I'm, I am, I am, when I am a sinner, I can hit the wrong target. That is a, a general, just a visual for what it means to be a sinner. People underestimate what it is. That in my very nature, I miss the target. No, not only I miss God's target, but I'm hitting another one. And I think that's the right one. That's what I'm doing. That's the target. That's what I want in my life. I want in my life that thing, so I am shooting at the wrong target because we are, we have sinned. The sin is in our nature. Well, when we think of God's work in the world, Christ comes into the world and sinners take Christ, and we crucify him and find him guilty because our sin has led us astray. We have wandered from understanding and remain in the congregation of the dead. Now, there are many congregations. I think that there is a bar room that you could call is a congregation. Uh, sitting around an X-rated movie could be a congregation. Uh, sitting around a circle of people that are not believers, have no mind for God, never talk about God. At a university classroom, you could have a professor of philosophy does not believe in God, does not care about God, but, but talks a lot has a lot of ideas, expresses himself, is very clever and very capable, but it is a congregation of the dead. It's the same in church life. I think I, I was brought up in a church of some kind, but there, there was a Sunday morning ceremony, and I left, but I was not touched. Christ was not preached. There was ceremony, activity, there was rituals, there was act, you know, the, the program, but there was no power. Well, 
Let's think about this for a second. Part two of our message this morning. One is we underestimate what sin is, and indeed many don't realize its destructive nature. What it's doing in our nation, what it does in the personality, what it does in my family life, what it can do in how it affects my people, my family, the very people I love. Sin is our problem. The United States of America, we are now in a political contest for the presidency. Well, that will not solve our problem. We hope it does improve things. We are interested, of course. But what the nation needs is you and I not living in our sin, but you and I finding Christ. You and I fellowshipping in Christ. You and I understanding who we are in Christ. You and I, like on the stage here, like you are in, we are together in this work, and we are realizing what Christ does in our hearts and what it means to serve people in our community, to care. Sin cares about itself. And the man that lives in sin cares about his pleasure, his own life, his own interest. But Jesus came. This is point number two. Christ came. Glory be to God. He tells us what our real problem is. He doesn't dance around. He's not... Uh, tickling our ears. He's not appeasing our consciences. He's not patting us on the back and saying it's not that bad. But he's going right to it. And he's saying your problem is your sin. He did it many times in the Gospels. It was the second most common theme in his teaching. It was sin. Isn't it interesting when it is the greatest problem in the human race, but in the church, there are churches that do not preach about it, that they don't point, they do not point it out, they do not address what our deepest problem is, and it is our sin. That's it. Me. Problems in the United States are many. One of the greatest ones is me. I may not change what is on the outside, but I can find Christ who changes us on the inside. Because he came to give us new life that is without sin. Let me explain this. We draw it this way. Here's a man. He has sin. You could say in his heart. He has an evil heart. And we can say... His heart is deceitful. We taught that last Sunday morning. But because of believing in Christ, he's been given a new nature. We can draw it this way, just make a symbol there of some kind. My new nature does not sin. 1 John 3, 8 and 9. Christ cannot sin. Christ dwells in you. Christ cannot sin. That's the new nature that we have. You know that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Well, what does it mean then for us? Well, it means new Capacity, renewed mind is possible. Renewed mind, filling of the Spirit is possible. I, I can believe what God says about me in the doctrine. This new capacity is drawn to doctrine. This is important. You have a, that's why you're sitting here today listening to doctrine. Didaskalia, Greek word. The doctrines, the mind of God in this book. 
opening up our minds to what God says and hearing him. This is not sin. The Bible is pure. The Bible is living. The Bible, Christ said, my words, they are spirit, they are life. This book is a spiritual book, and it speaks to our new nature. Like Mary, when she was pregnant with Christ, three months, she went to see her cousin Elizabeth, or Mary was newly impregnated. I'm sorry, I think Elizabeth was six months at the time pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary was newly, um, she was carrying Christ in the very beginning of the pregnancy. And when she went down to Hebron to see Elizabeth, she cried out her name, and then the, John the Baptist leaped in her womb. And it says in the scripture that John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. And we draw it this way. Here's Elizabeth, and here is Mary, and they both are carrying the spiritual, and there's a movement inside. This is us now. Hello. Hi. Praise God. I believe. Did you hear the word? Did you trust God? Have you heard? Have you sensed it? Do you know about it? Do you know you're a new creation? And there's a leaping that happens in our assembly. And you say, yes, amen, in your heart. You say, yes, that's what I believe. I am not hungry for sin, our first point. I am hungry now for righteousness, our second point. Christ put it in you. You have a hunger for it. You want it. You want to hear the Bible preached to you. You want to fellowship with your brother and sister. You want to get in the car and go serve somebody. Uh, you want to show up for the Asia prayer meeting. You want to uh, go to some kind of a conference where there's something going on that is from God. You want to meet your brothers and sisters. You want to uh, just kind of sweep the parking lot or, or show up and say, this is mine. I belong. I'm part of this. That's awesome. We say that when we used to hitchhike as hippies back in the 70s, early, late 60s and early 70s, we hitchhike and go anywhere we wanted to. We get in the car, go for a ride, get out, say thank you, shut the door, and then it, you never paid for it. Oh, those were the good old days. <laughs> Did you pay for the gas? Did you pay for the tire repair? Did you pay for the oil change? Did you ever wash that car? Did you put new wipers on it? Did you have to replace the muffler? No, but the owner did. Well, some people think of church like that. They say, I'll go for the ride. You serve me. You take care of me. You give to me. And the minute it doesn't go good, I'm out of here. Well, Christ came into us, gave us his nature. Christ is in it. Christ is owning it. Christ belongs. Christ is saying, when the going gets tough, I show up. Christ says, I'm here. I own the car. I am part of it. When it breaks down, I'm there. I lay down my life for the brethren. I am part of the whole thing. I belong to the body of Christ. We drink the same spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We belong. But I like to say that in 1 Peter chapter 4, there was a way we used to live. Read it with me, please. Verse 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, loss, excess of wine. Anybody here ever drink 
Too much wine in your past life? Revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries. Yes, we used to live like that. And then we change, verse 4. They think it's strange that you run not with them. Your friend calls you up. Hey, you want a party Friday night? No, thanks. I'll be at the church. Come and see me. What? I'll be at 6025 Moravia Park Drive if you ever want to see me again. <laughs> what? You're nuts. You're a religious fanatic. You've lost your marbles. Whenever you lose your marbles, come and see me. But this is what Peter is saying. That we have changed. That we have a new way of life. Look at verse uh, 4. They think it's strange yet you run not with them in the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. They turn around, they hang up the phone, and they speak evil of you. That's all right. I used to be with a bunch of hippies up at college in upstate New York years ago. And when I lost all of them, when I wouldn't do what they were doing, I was by myself, and then one came to me, and two, and there were now three of us, and we were following Christ. And 50 or so went their way, and they lived their life, and the three of us have gone this way, and um, that's how it goes. But now I've got you in my life, not them. Maybe them, too. I do not know. That was 40 years ago. I hope they're okay. I love them, but I'm sorry. I know what sin does in somebody's life. You know that. Remaining in the congregation of the dead. No life. No spiritual purpose. No real joy. No real serving, no reaching out, no going into the highways and byways. I want to encourage some of you, maybe I've never been to Europe, maybe in March might be your first time. Come to Hungary with us. Buy a ticket, $670 round trip on the internet just now. And sit in a big hall. Russians, 50 nations, Russians, Slovaks, Hungarians, Romanians, Albanians, French, Germans, Swedish, and sit there just like this. And in your heart, Christ is fellowshipping. You are welcome. If not this year, sometime. In any case, we are different. Look at verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. They might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. For the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober, watch unto prayer. Being sober means being doctrinal. That's why you come here, to get doctrine. Have an open Bible. It's fun when you start reading the Bible. It's fun. You start flipping the page. Oh, that relates to this. Oh, that. Oh, that means. Oh, yes. And I remember. And in Psalm 119. And I realize. And yes, I know we are in the end times. And there really is a rapture, you know. Paul taught the new believers in Thessalonians about the rapture in First Thessalonians chapter 2 and Second th chapter 3. There is a rapture. We'll be taken out. Well, that's the doctrine that is needed to build us up. And then it says in verse 8, above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. Above all things, 
You really have a lot of love, fervent love. That's the word charity, agape love among yourselves. Fervent. Like the folks up on the stage and sitting down here in the auditorium and the people in different parts of the world when we meet and we have fervent charity among ourselves. It solves our problems. Love is the greatest uh, way of life in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is the way to live, le to learn to love, to learn to get out beyond yourself, uh, to learn to serve one another. And we have the word of active work. <clears throat> Sharpen your talents, acquire skills, work on developing our spiritual gifts by love. Act out of love. Learn to serve. You find yourself spirit-filled you find yourself forgiving. You find yourself in prayer. And then it says in verse 8, for charity should cover the multitude of sins. There are a lot of sins. There is greater love. Let's write it this way. Number three, Christ gives greater grace. There is sin, but there's greater grace. He gives grace so that we don't live in our sin. It is more fun to live in the spirit. There is a down, there is a lot of hype on, on selling to the public entertainment and, and success and celebrityism. And, and the whole thing about the spiritual life is underrated. They don't know about it. When you find it, you find your gifts operating. You find yourself spirit-filled. You find yourself living in faith. Then it says here in verse 9, use hospitality to another without grudging. I think hospitality is like this. Here are these men, men here, for example, and I have my space, and I welcome them into my space, and they invite me into their space. This is hospitality. You are welcome in my life, in my heart. You're welcome. What I have, maybe it can help you. What I have, what I can give you, what my wisdom Maybe I'm able to help you. My love, my prayer, my care, my faith, maybe I am able to help you. This is what Paul, is, Peter is saying, that it used to be we lived in the congregation of the dead with excess of wine and uh, guffaws and uh, drunkenness and, and all of that kind of society and community, and then we found righteousness. Christ came, and now we have our gifts. Look at verse 10. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. Minister. Sitting with somebody, getting to know people, sitting with them and learning to minister. I agree. I am tired sometimes of small talk. There's a place for that. But then, and I, I love it because I love to know people and be together and have a good time together. And then I love it when the Spirit speaks, the ministry. I love it when, when somebody says, let's go into the next village. Let's go knock on some doors. Or let's go to a cafe or a, a, a cafeteria. Uh, let's sit down in a park bench. Let's pray and care about kids at a university campus. Let's reach out. Let's minister to each other. Verse 10, 
Even so, minister the same one to another, the gift as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God's grace, Pastor Hadley said it, God's grace that we motored into church today in our own power. God's grace that we had breakfast. God's grace that we can talk. God's grace that we can go. God's grace that we can have a vision and care. And then verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Look at it. Who can speak this? You know? Life. Life. Who can talk from here? I don't mean opening the Bible and quoting. I mean the mind. Who can give a message? Who can say, forgive? Where in what hair salon can the, the barber Gave godly counsel. Where and what couch, in what office can a, a person sit and be ministered the oracles of God, the wisdom of Proverbs, the worship of Psalms, the doctrines of the epistles, the stories of the book of Acts? There is a famine in our country of the word. Of God. Amos 8, verse 11. God said, I will send a famine not of bread, but of the word of God. Nobody will speak it. The Bible is uh, ostracized, marginalized. The Bible is ridiculed. The Bible is left over there. They don't care. They, they criticize it. They have an arrogant spirit because of sin that is in the world, and it is in us. But we have found another way, honestly. We got humble before the Bible. Look at Psalm 119. I'm going to close in a minute. But Psalm 119 in verse 33. The psalmist is unstable, and he writes Psalm 119. He is unstable in his flesh. But he knows who he is in Christ. He is unstable and cannot trust in himself. Like you and I, I, I feel that way many times. I cannot trust in myself, but I am trusting in God. And look at verse 33. It says, teach me, O Lord. Verse 34, give me understanding. Who is he, what he, who's he talking to? He's saying to God. Help me, teach me, give me, make me to go in the path of your commandments. Listen, it's simple. You can't say, I will go in the right path. I have this now. I am able. You cannot always say that every day, but you have to say like this. I cannot, but teach me, God. I cannot. But guide me, you guide me in the way of understanding. The next one. Incline my heart unto your testimonies. You do this. Where, where is this, this spirit of faith? Is Christ in us? We're saying to Jesus is saying to the Father, Father, you do this. Christ, you do this. Then verse Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity. That's a good pornography, eh, verse 37. What is the new man saying in his prayer? He is saying, I don't want it. It is filthy. I don't need it. It steals my time, my energy, my freedom, my creativity. I live in guilt because of pornography. It is sin. I have no interest in it. By God's grace, I am a new creation. God gave me a new capacity. I'm able to live a righteous life. I'm able to live like Christ. God gave it to me. Turn away my eyes, O oh God, from beholding vanity. 
Take away my eyes from that. Incline my heart unto your ways. You see that. That is the sickness of America and me and every human being on this earth. It is our sin is our problem. But the answer is Christ. Christ and the filling of the Spirit. Christ and doctrine in the soul. Christ and my gift operating. When your gifts are operating, you enjoy your new life. When you start to serve, you find opportunities. You, when you take the opportunity and you grab it, and you say, now i got two opportunities. I'm not laying around living in sin. I'm living in faith with a new nature, with a spirit of God moving in us. Let's close chapter 4, verse 11. <clears throat> if any man speak, let him gossip. No. If any man speak, let him swear and curse the day he was born. If any man speak, let him tell dirty jokes. Let him be proud and arrogant and boast about himself. No. If any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. That's what we learned in the ministry. I got a verse. I am pointing to Christ. I got something in my heart. God gave it to me. If any man minister, let him minister with the ability which God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> well, I was listening this morning, a couple of brothers saying they were in Federal Hill last night. They had so much fun on the street. They're ministering there. You know, we have a new building now in Federal Hill. We have, they, they donated, a church building was donated to us and the young men have been working on it, and they have a project on that. And just to hear these young men say, God was with us. It was such a joy. We had so much fun in the ministry on the sidewalk in Federal Hill. On the sidewalk, meeting somebody whose heart was open and saying that they are interested and that they are, I love, what is that? That's the gift. The gift's that operate. So, I'll close with one shocking thing happening in our country. It makes me angry, and yet I don't care because this is the time we're living in. But in Illinois, there's a public high school. And there's a young boy there that says he's a girl. So the school has been trying to accommodate this man because of the human rights issues in our country and that he has a right to use the girls' bathroom. So they gave him that right. Then he said, I need to use the girls' locker room. So they built something special there for him to be able to be in the girls' locker room. It sounds crazy to go that far. But now he says, I have a right to take the showers with the girls. Principal said, no way. The United States government in Washington, D.C. got involved. The Department of Education said it is demanded. They must accommodate that man's desire or else the school loses its federal funding. What? What? Our leaders in Washington... They are saying such a thing? Are these the wise men that are leading our country? That are the guardians, appointed guardians of the care of our culture and our country? Yes. That's where we are today. Well, if you live in sin, you may not care. If you live in sin, you may laugh about the whole story. If you live in sin, you'll make jokes about it on television and the talk shows. 
If you live in sin, you'll encourage it. You'll propagate it. You'll laugh about it in your filthy mind. Because you are a sinner. And it is sin that is so destructive. And the reason why we are so abhorred is because we have found another answer. It is not sin, but it is Christ. And God is angry with such sin. For it is destructive to that young man and to those girls in that school and the headmaster and every family and to our culture and the coming generations and the craziness and the foolishness of the whole thing is ridiculous. Ridiculous. But let it be, let it be declared. Let it be heard and let it be understood and let it be known this, that Man, men that are sinners have no other option but to be sinners unless they come to Christ. Christ is the answer for every heart. Christ is the answer for every human being. Christ is the only answer man has. Christ is the answer, and you better get it right in your mind too. Because you got the capacity for it. That's this point here. You have the capacity there. But you also have the capacity to live like a fool. Wander out of the way of understanding. You leave it. You leave the church on purpose. You leave the Bible on purpose. You leave trusting in God. And you live in your sin. You wander out of the way of understanding and remain in the congregation of the dead. And you wonder how you got there. You wake up one morning. So how did I get in this filthy place? That I hate it. I actually hate it. Well, you made your bed and you are living in it. And the answer is Christ. Come back to Christ. Come back to the way. Come back to the doctrine. Come back to the Holy Spirit. Come back to faith. Come back to the way of faith. To learn and humble yourself before the brethren and say, I am here. Thank you, Lord. I am here. I am in fellowship I bear witness, this is the way. Because Christ said it, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. When you have the life, you never forget it. I am happy all the day. I got something going on. I am a believer. I am participating. I am learning. It is not always easy, but long-suffering goes a long way, and we are able. Sometimes it is unbelievable. It's over the top. You say, I have more fun than anybody than when their corn and wine increases in Psalm 4. I cannot even believe how much joy and peace I have. It is abundant. I cannot believe how good it is for my family. I cannot believe how great it is to lie down in peace. I am so happy that I have something going on in my heart that's bigger than myself. That's what Christ gave you. Not just uh, uh, a few people. Us, all of us, we got. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me? <laughs> Thanks for your prayers. I had bronchitis when I came back. Some of you were wondering if I am all healed up. I'm doing good. Thank you for your prayers and your love and, uh, and for listening and being here today. We're not hitchhikers. Tell your neighbor, I own the car. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, I own the car. I got the rear wheels covered. I own the car. All right, all right, pray with me now. If you're here today and you'd like Jesus in your life, birth, new birth, your first time, Come into Christ. Be a pray to him. Jesus, I trust you. Please say that prayer in your heart. And you're born again. Jesus, I trust you. If it's your first time, raise your hand, please. First time, anyone? First time saying that prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I trust in you. Anyone, raise your hand. Raise your hand, anyone at all. Thank you in Jesus' name. Keep praying for salvations in our church. Pray for people in the city of Baltimore. Bring your neighbors here. Good things happening every week. Christmas is coming. Have a plan. Bring your neighbors. They would be coming to Christ by faith. And
God bless you as a church. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit. This is your church. You are our head, and we are paying attention. In Christ's name, amen. Could Pastor Jason come forward?